this morning, reconciled by the cross, saved by his life. Reconciled by the cross and saved by his life. And I took the, uh, the title out of verse 10, where uh, it talks about we have been enemies. We, have, we were enemies of God and we were reconciled by God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I'd like to talk about the cross and uh, reconciliation. And then the final part of the message, I want to talk about the life that is ours in Jesus Christ, coming from this uh, text here. Uh, I think I'll read... Uh, verse 20 through 25 first before we read the text in uh, chapter 4. And uh, there Paul says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And Paul is talking about Abraham there, how he didn't stagger at the promises of God, but he was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to also to perform. And uh, Paul is alluding to the fact that God promised Abraham a son. And from that promise of a son, he would uh, form a nation. And of course, uh, Abraham, a little bit like Zacharias in our Sunday school lesson, Abraham was 100 years old and he did not have a son. And before that, he tried to attempt to establish the promise of God by having a son with uh, Sarah's handmaid, and Ishmael was born. But he soon learned that, uh, he learned that God doesn't need help in fulfilling his promises. But God is faithful. And then in verse 22 of chapter 4, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness, or... Abraham's faith in what the promises of God, uh, he was counted as righteous because of his faith in the promises of God. The word imputed there means credited or accredited. And then also he goes on, Paul goes on and he says, now it was not written for, now it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him, that it was imputed to him but for us also whom it shall be imputed, we, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So the lesson of Abraham's faith and how righteousness was imputed or credited to him for his faith is not just for Abraham. But he, Paul is saying it's for us today. How did our faith in Jesus Christ is what gives us righteousness in God. And he says, the one that raised up Jesus from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, why don't you stand and we'll read the first 10 verses of chapter 5 as our text, and then we'll want to go into the message from there. Therefore, you know, Paul says, okay, now what you heard about Abraham, he says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without Christ, without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved 
by his life. Let's uh, pray. Thank you, God, for your scripture, the word of God. Thank you for your unconditional love towards us. Thank you for the cross. And thank you for the life that you give us through the cross that is ours in you. Teach us this morning what you would have for us to hear from you. And help us then, Lord, to claim your promises for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Here in Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Enemies. Do you consider yourself as an enemy to God? Have you at one time been an enemy of God? I think we all were. The word enemies there means adversary, hateful, actively hostile. Now that sounds pretty radical, doesn't it? To think of ourselves as that. In Colossians 1.21, Paul says that this includes you and me. We were, he says, we were once far away from God. We were his enemies separated from him because of our evil thoughts and actions. Our, actually, we were alienated from God. Now, while that is true, that we are alienated from God because of our thoughts and our actions are that's our natural man is created because of sin. We are that way. But there's another side to that alienation in being an enemy from God and a hater of God. In the fifth psalm, verse 4 through 6, the psalmist writes, O oh God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. Our actions, our thoughts as unbelievers, as ungodly people, God doesn't take any pleasure in that, the psalmist says. He says, you cannot tolerate the sins or the actions or the works of the wicked. God loves the sinner, but he hates the works and the actions of the sinner. Then he goes on, the psalmist goes on and he says, Therefore, the foolish or the proud may not stand in your presence. There's no room in God's presence for foolish, proud individuals like you and I. And I want you to remember that. And he says, We will not, the foolishness and pride. And iniquity will not stand in the presence of God because God hates workers of iniquity. That's what the psalmist uses. So he uses the word hate. And I, I don't, I, I'm not here to say that God hates us, but God hates the works of iniquity though, and sin. And that word is put in there, it reveals God's perfect standard of justice. Both in principle and in practice. In fact, the psalmist goes on to say in, verse, in chapter 5, he says, I will destroy them that speak leasing or falsehood. Gives the idea that those who live a false life, God will abhor. Or he will allow them to perish. Now we could... Go back into the New Testament again. A number of verses in Philippians 3.18, James 4, verse 4. Uh, 1 John is a number of verses that talks about those that are anti-God and anti-Christ and workers of iniquity. And while that is true, I'm, I'm thankful this morning for the cross and that we can be, even though that paints a, a bleak picture of mankind in our sinfulness, in our sinful condition as haters and enemies of God, 
that verse 10 of Romans chapter 5 says that we can be reconciled with God through the cross. The word reconciled there means an end of the estrangement caused by the original sin between God and humanity. God's very own creation turned against him, disobeyed his commandment, and sin entered into the world. You know, Jesus... God's very own son was crucified on a cross. We heard about that last Sunday. A very good message on the crucifixion. And we often hear this said, and it's true, that the cross, the work of the cross, Jesus dying on the cross and being crucified, appeased the wrath of God. Now the Bible doesn't exactly say that in those words, but it is true that the death of Jesus provided a propitiation or an atonement, and that atonement was satisfactory to God. The atonement that Jesus Christ made on the cross. Romans 3.23, very familiar scripture that we can all understand. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified but freely by his grace through the redemption. There's that word redeemed again. That is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25 of Romans chapter 3, whom, that is Jesus, God has set forth to be a propitiation. There's that word again. An atonement through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past though the forbear- through the forbearance of God. What is, what is Paul saying in these verses? Paul is talking about Christ's violent death satisfied the offended holiness and wrath of God against his own creation. Man sinned. You know, this past week, uh, one of our granddaughters asked their mom, why did God put the garden in the tree, the, the tree in the middle of the garden when he knew that, that uh, man would partake of it? Why did he put it there? And I, I thought about that. It's, it's an awesome question. Why did God put the tree there? You know, the justice of God had the right to consume Adam and Eve. And thus annihilating the human race. And Paul talks about through the forbearance of God. His, the word forbearance in, the means to hold back. God held back his wrath and just punishment against sin. Now, Paul also says that in, in past, God's past, you know, sometimes we think that when Paul says that in passing times, God did not, did, did not condemn the people in the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints. But it was the forbearance of God that he did, in his love for man, that he did not consume them. And so they look forward to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In faith, they were saved and counted as righteousness. And he's speaking of the Old Testament saints how they look forward to the promise that God gave beginning in in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the fall of man. God spoke these words to Satan, the serpent, who was caused Adam and Eve to fall. 
And he said, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall, to the woman, it's the woman's seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And what God was saying there to Adam and Eve when he gave that promise is, I'm going to send the Redeemer. And that's what we were studying about in Sunday school, about the coming of the Messiah. I'm going to send the Redeemer, and through his death, he told Satan that I will crush the control that you have on mankind. Larry prayed for Operation 612, and, and I think Dave was talking about being out at jail and the men having their addictions and not, they don't want to do what they do, and yet they can't overcome. And the question was asked, well, do we, we're not in drugs maybe, but are there other things that we are addicted to? And, and God was saying to Adam and Eve that I will send a redeemer, a seed of the woman, that will come and through death on a cross, he will crush the power and the control that Satan has over man. Praise God for that. We can be delivered. We can be redeemed. It's going to cost something. God said, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He said that to Satan. You're going to cause my Redeemer to be sacrificed and die on a cross. Romans chapter 4, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of the Jewish nation. But he was made right with God by faith. Not by his good deeds, not by the works that he did or the life that he lived. Else he would have had something to boast about. That was God's plan, God's way or plan to reconcile Abraham. And verse 3 of, verse, of Romans chapter 4 says, For the scripture tells us, Abraham believed God and God counted him righteous because of his faith. The word counted there in chapter 4 of Romans, Romans chapter 4 means to take inventory or to conclude. God concluded that Abraham was righteous because of his faith. I don't know, did God look at Abraham's life and did he take inventory? The word also means inventory. Righteousness means equity. It means equity. It means justification. An example of equity would be if you own a car that's worth $25,000, but you still owe $10,000 on the car to the bank or to a friend that you borrowed money from, the equity of the car would only be $15,000. When I, when I read that, I thought about that, then I thought about God declaring Abraham as righteous because of his faith. And I thought, when you, this question came to me, when I compare myself with God, what is my equity? 50%, 25, 10%. You know, when I look at God, God's holiness, his justice, his righteousness, I'm bankrupt. I'm bankrupt. Isaiah, when he saw God's holiness and his righteousness, he said, I'm undone. I'm unclean. I'm part of a nation that is bankrupt. Totally undone before God. The Bible says that there was a man in the land of Uz, Uz whose name was Job. And it says he was perfect and upright. One that feared or reverenced God and eschewed evil. In other words, Job stayed away from evil. But at the end of the narrative, of the life of the story of Joseph, or 
not Joseph, Job. God challenges Job. And Job responds to the Lord in this way. He says, I know that you can say anything and no one can stop you. Job's response towards God. You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such arrogance? Job was responding in arrogance to God of God's questions that he had for him. And Job says, it is I. And I was talking about things that I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. And then God said, listen to me, Job. And I will speak. God said, I have some questions for you, Job. And you must answer them. And when Job realized the greatness and the awesomeness of God and the justice of God and the holiness of God, he said, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you before my own eyes. Then Job says, wherefore I abhor myself. I disdain myself or loathe myself and I repent in dust and ashes. So Abraham was not counted as righteous because of his works or what he did. But he was counted righteous because of his faith in God, in Jesus, the coming of the Messiah. God in his, uh, we need to understand that God's righteousness and love, wrath and forgiveness are eternally perfect. God is not divided in his work. God's wrath against sin is not because there's an absence of love in his heart or in him towards us. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation or an atonement for our sins. God demonstrated his love towards us in that way. This great sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross was not accomplished in secret. It was made in public. God publicly displayed his son at Calvary so that all the world could see his great love that he has for mankind. And so we come to the cross. The cross is an open display of the righteousness and justice of God, demanding an atonement for sin, for the penalty of sin of man against the holy God. The cross was an instrument used, and the justice of God demanded that there would be or there was a penalty paid for sin. But it is also a public testimony of God's love for man. God did not wait until we came to him. But rather he embraced us in our our dirtiest place that we were in. In our own sin. He embraced us where we were. Rather than demanding that we ascend to him, God came down to us. Love gave. Love hoped. Love believed. Love transformed. Even when we could not respond to love, love was offered to us through the cross. Secondly, by the cross, the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Paul talks about it. By the cross, the world is spiritually dead to the... By, because of the cross, the world is spiritually dead to believers, to unbelievers, and those that are dead towards God. When a person trusts in God, faith in Jesus Christ, the work of the cross, salvation is offered to us and we become transformed and born again in our hearts. So it's through the cross that we have victory over sin and over the world. The world is the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of our life. Through the cross, the power of Satan is crushed. We alluded to that in the promise that God gave to Adam and Eve and to the Old Testament saints about the woman's seed, Jesus Christ. So through the cross, the power of Satan is destroyed. The word head there means the control that Satan had over us. And finally, by the cross, the power of God, that is the resurrection life of Jesus, is divinely given to all who believe in faith. We become rooted and grounded in love. External things do not control or dictate to how we live anymore but the internal power of God that comes to us. God lives within us. Now, I want to go back to the first part of chapter 5 and look at the life of Christ within us. First of all, when we come to God by faith in Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul says that being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. We talked about being the enemies of God. And when we become justified by faith in the cross of Jesus, the first thing that God offers to us is his peace. The first great result of justification by faith is a relationship with God and peace in our hearts through Jesus Christ. We were the enemies of God. God brought an end to that enmity that was between us and God and established a relationship where we have peace, where we have rest, we have quietness in our hearts. Before this, we were probably striving to do more, striving to become a better person, maybe even acting religious and doing good deeds to establish a relationship with God and peace in our hearts did not work. It's by faith through grace that we have peace with God. Secondly, Apostle Paul in in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, he says, by whom we have access by faith into his grace. Access into his grace. Remember back in in the fifth psalm, it said, The foolish and the proud workers of iniquity shall not stand in your sight or in your presence. The psalmist was saying that. But now because of the cross of Jesus Christ, Paul says we have access into his grace. The word access simply means admission. And the word admission means a statement acknowledging the truth of something. When you go to a concert, or you go to a ball game, or you go to the airport to fly somewhere, you go with a ticket in your hand. That is evidence, gives evidence that you paid for entrance into that place. And then the psalmist said because of sin, And wickedness and evil. We don't have access into the presence of God. But now Paul says, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, we now have access into his presence. God brought us into an undeserved place 
a place where we do not have, even have the ability to go to ourselves. The word access, this word access is only used three times in the New Testament in this way. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 and Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12. As sinners, we have no right or worthiness that we can come into the presence of God. The moment you became a believer and God's Spirit was born within you and you realize that the resources of the Trinity are ours, and the moment we became believers, the Holy Spirit presents us before the Father in heaven. And now we have access to come into his presence. Why? Because he justified us. He made us righteous. And before we couldn't stand in his presence, now through the grace of God, we can come into his presence with boldness, with confidence, the Hebrew writer says. Not self-confidence, but Christ's confidence. Nus allows us to come into the presence of God. And the Holy Spirit is your admission, your evidence of your right to come into the presence of God. So also you as a true born-again believer have the right to come into his presence. There is no standing in line. There is no one at the gate that says you can't enter. God is available 24-7. He's there all the time. And we have that right, that boldness, that confidence that we can come into his presence. Thirdly, Paul says, we stand there in hope of the glory of God. The word hope there says means we stand with anticipation. We stand there with expectation. We stand there with confidence. The word hope there is speaking of something that is certain but not yet realized. We are in the world but not of the world. We are in the world but not citizens of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We live here, but our ultimate destiny is heaven in the presence of God. So this is future, and yet it's present. We can even come now into the presence of God. We stand there in hope of the glory of God. Jesus said in John 17, verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Jesus is speaking to his Father and he says, the glory that you gave me, I have passed on to them, you and I, as believers. That they may be one even as we, Jesus and the Father are one. That is amazing, is it not? That we have the glory that was given to Jesus. And he shares that with us because of our faith, because of the cross. And we are given to us the intrinsic nature of God or, the, or, or of Jesus Christ. And then he follows up in verse 23 of John 17. I in them and thou in me that they may be perfect in one. So the idea here is that we are brought together with Jesus Christ in complete perfection through the saving knowledge of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Then John goes, uh, uh, Jesus goes on in John 17 and he says, and he brings, to, or, or rather 1 Corinthians brings to reality what Jesus is talking about in John 17. And Paul says, for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being Many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized or immersed into one body. Whether we be Jews, Gentiles, whether we be bound or free, 
and have been made have all been made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. Not only is he talking about our oneness with Jesus Christ as individuals, but we have oneness with him as a body of believers together. We have oneness with Christ. And he goes on and he says, the purpose of this is so that the world may know the inhabitants of this world may know that I love them and about, they can learn about my love. So in verse 3, we show that the ref, we reflect the glory of God. Then Paul goes on to say how we reflect his glory. And he says, in tribulations. And I read that and read it again and I said, surely Paul, you're jesting with us. We reflect his glory when everything goes right. When everything goes smooth. No, no, Paul said, we reflect his glory even in tribulations. When things don't go as we think, they should. Tribulations means pressures. It means affliction. It means anguish. It means burdens. It means persecutions. It means trouble. But Paul said, even that, in that, in the life of Christ within you, you can reflect his glory. And Paul goes on and he says, that helps uh, develop endurance in your life. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our hope that we have in God. And he said, this hope that you have in Christ will not lead to disappointment in him. You know, the trying moments that we experience here in the light of eternity are short. And how God helps us through that is evidence of his love to us so that our hearts can be filled with love. Well, you say that's right and that's good. And we are reconciled to God through the cross. And we are made alive in Christ through our relationship with him. But you ask this morning, what about my struggles? What about my temptations that I face? What about the blunders that I make in my life? and the sins that I've committed. This past two weeks, I've been reading the 107th Psalm. And I've really been blessed by by that Psalm and reading that Psalm. And the Psalmist starts with, he says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And I thought that's very appropriate. We just came through a time of Thanksgiving season. And I I trust that you were thankful for the mercy of God and how his mercy endureth forever. Then he says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. When was the last time that you declared your redemption, talked about your redemption? You know, maybe we're unthankful people. And maybe we're too quiet about a redemption and what the cross means to us and what the cross has done for us and how we were reconciled with God and saved from our enmity with God. And I want you to read that Psalm, the 107th Psalm. In the 43 verses, the, the psalmist reflects on the despair and the troubles of Israel. He talks about they being wonders in the desert. He talks about them being people of captivity. He talks about their constant rebellious and how they rejected the counsel of the Most High. He talks about them going through the shadows of darkness and death. He talks about how they were fools because they transgressed against the Most High. And how they were reeling to and fro and staggering like drunken men. 
and the list goes on and on and it seems endless. But four times in this chapter, the psalmist says, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. And I thought to myself, how many times do I cry out to the Lord in my distress and in my troubles? And four times in these 43 verses, he says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And I ask myself the question, how many times do I praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. In the light of what the cross has done for me, that I've been reconciled with God, and I have peace with God, I have rest in my heart, and the power of God lives within me because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so how thankful are we for that, that we are reconciled by faith, in the cross of Jesus Christ, and we can live by the resurrection power of Jesus. Saved by the cross, reconciled by the cross, and saved by the life of Jesus within us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we bow before you this morning. And Jesus, I just want to stand here and thank you that you have reconciled us that you've broken the enmity that was between us and your Father. And it was because of the cross of Jesus, your cross, that you went on. Because of the sacrifice that you made at Calvary, that we can be reconciled with you. And then we thank you for the life that is ours through you, the resurrection power that we can live in. Forgive us, Lord, when we despair Forgive us, Lord, when we give in to our own flesh and blood. Forgive us, Lord, when we yield to temptation and do not realize the power that is ours to live in victory and in freedom. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, we praise you for your unconditional love to us. But we also thank you this morning for your justice and your holiness. And then we thank you that we can stand in your presence because of the cross. And we can come to you boldly with confidence. And we can cry out to you. We are a blessed people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.